So what works? We start by restoring balance, okay, physical balance. And, and I've mentioned this again, and, and that's why I've got this as a separate sleep, because that really is key. What I, there's a lot of techniques out there in terms of cognitive behavioral treatment and things like that, where you change your thinking and, and you work with your emotions and things. But what I found is that those are extremely difficult when you're building tension in your body. And I've never seen a person come in for counseling who didn't have a significant amount of tension in their body. There was no one who came in in, relax, in balance physically. Okay. It didn't happen, didn't see it, okay? Um, and so the body is the storehouse for tension and it's gonna drive everything else. So the equivalent of trying to change my thinking when my body is building tension, to me is like trying to turn a corner at 60 miles an hour. I mean, there are people who can do it. I mean, I've seen it on TV or in movies, okay, but they're highly trained in their special conditions. Uh, most of us can't do it, I sure can't, okay? We, the rest of us need to slow down first. And when we slow down, when we restore balance, okay, now the rest of the things come online, okay? Now our emotions are available. Now we can think and we can reflect and we can discern and ask questions and look at what's going on. Our perceptions open up, our frame enlarges, okay? Uh, our filter becomes clearer so we can see and understand what other people are feeling and what the situation is about, okay? So starting with the body opens up everything else, okay? So all of the personal resources that go offline when we're in crisis mode come back online when the body is in balance, okay? So you're less likely to think about what's wrong when you're in physical balance, okay? Questions about that? And I, I'd have to say probably 98% of the time that's what I wound up starting with when I was doing counseling, uh, just because if I didn't, I would always go back to it anyway. And the only exceptions were where there was a specific problem where we had to do problem solving and dealing with that right away. But being in balance physically makes everything else easier. Being out of balance makes everything else harder. Simple as that. Anything you want to do is easier when you're in balance. Okay, so what works? Um, what works is to get your autonomic nervous system back into balance. That can take uh, anywhere from a few hours to a few weeks, depending on how out of balance you are, okay? Uh, but I want to explain really specifically what's going on uh, because it really helps to understand that process and know what you're doing, okay? The major nerve that, that feeds the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of your nervous system that does maintenance, is about the size of your thumb, okay? It wraps around your esophagus and passes through the diaphragm uh, the diaphragm is a muscle at the bottom of the lung, shaped like a parachute. Um, and there's an opening in the back and the center of the diaphragm called the esophageal hiatus. And that nerve with the esophagus passes through that opening. Okay. And what I found, just from observation, because I, I, I picked up on, on this uh, uh, type of, of breathing early on in my career and, and, and studied it in terms of the experience of, of the people I was working with and adapted it. And what I found is the movement of the diaphragm, the rhythm of that movement is key. When the rhythm is three to four seconds down, three to four seconds up, okay, my understanding of what's happening is you're stimulating that nerve with the movement of the diaphragm. And they actually have an electrical way of stimulating that nerve that they've gotten some results from too, but this is natural and you don't have to hook yourself up to a machine to do it, okay? That activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which suppresses the, the sympathetic nervous system, and it works in less than a minute, okay? I can see someone who uh, comes in, and I teach them the breathing, and when I see that rhythm happening, okay, then I, can, I ask them, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm feeling calmer now. And their voice changes, and I can see their perceptions are opening up. Okay, and when I worked at, uh, at Carroll, the residential facility, you know, with problems with people with violence, we would hold them in a basket hold, okay, when they're out of control. And what I found is their arm was right underneath their diaphragm. So I'm holding their wrist, okay, so I'm holding onto the wrist. I'm standing behind the person holding them like this, and I can feel their breathing with my chest. So what I would do is I would time their breathing, and when they exhaled, I'd pull on this hand, and then I'd let it up slowly and I'd try to gradually slow it down. I'd create a little vacuum at the bottom of the lungs until I could get that, and this is one of the ways I learned that rhythm, 
okay? And then I would let them breathe on their own, and then I'd stimulate it, and let them breathe on their own, and stimulate it. And I found that when they took three breaths on their own, where I could feel that arm moving, I'd let them go. And I was never hit in four years of doing that work, not once, okay? I would hold people three to five minutes on average. Others might hold them for as long as 45 minutes because they just keep on struggling and fighting. But once the parasympathetic nervous system was activated, I knew they weren't going to turn on me. That was the end of it, okay? So it's, it's as clear and as simple and as powerful as that, okay? One of the issues you have to deal with, though, are the stress hormones that get into your bloodstream, okay? Because that's what keeps you in crisis mode. That's survival, okay? So you're getting away from the bear, okay? Um, and what happens is your liver actually produces more sugar when you're in crisis mode. When you're in sympathetic nervous system crisis mode, you're producing sugar to give energy to your muscles so you can get more done, run faster away from the bear, okay? When your parasympathetic nervous system is activated, your liver starts cleaning out your blood. And that's how you get rid of the stress hormones. And so I came up with the, the figure uh, four to six times a day. And actually, I upped it to six and 10 because there were some situations where six wasn't enough. So now I say six to 10 uh, of doing the, the natural rhythmic breathing for three to five minutes that always restored balance. And that can take as long as a month in real the extreme outside cases where there was just an incredible amount of tension because you've got, first of all, you've got to master it, which takes some time. Uh, but secondly, you've got to activate it enough so that your liver has a chance to clean out your blood. Because as soon as you stop activating it, your sympathetic nervous system is going to charge up again because of the stress hormones. So the more you do it, the more your liver works for you instead of against you, and the quicker you recover. Okay. So here's how it works. It's easier to show sitting down, okay? And, uh, and actually, because most of my patients were sitting when I was teaching it, okay? Um, but what I would have them do is to lean back a little bit, okay? It's easier to lean back because if I'm forward like this, if you think about it, um, my stomach and intestines are pushing up against my diaphragm and it's just got more resistance. When I lean back, okay, the stomach and intestines drop down a little bit. It's just easier to move it. Okay, and if you put your hand right at the base of your ribs and sniff, like you're smelling some apple pie, something like that, It'd be nice on a day like this. Okay, that's your diaphragm. That little bumping under there is your diaphragm. So now just breathe in and allow the air to come to the bottom of your lungs so that muscle moves. And what happens is your belly moves out as you breathe in and comes down as you breathe out. And if you try to control it, okay, I'm going to get this right, I'm going to do this exactly right, it doesn't work, <laughs> okay? It's the natural way of breathing. You're restoring the natural way of breathing so you allow it to happen. And that in itself can take a few days of practice, okay? If there's a lot of tension around the diaphragm, um, just allow that to work. And I have a, a video on my website uh, that, uh, and it was actually uh, a very fortunate thing because I had a, a nursing student who volunteered to work with me on the video and I hadn't met her before. But I had a sequence that I would go through with my patients when they couldn't master the breathing right away um, of different things that I would try. And she actually could not do the breathing herself until we got to the very last step, which is something I had only used like four or five times in the last 10 years. Okay, so, so it was a real life situation on there that shows how to deal with the obstacles of that. So basically, you allow the breath to come in and it looks like this. So there's no pause. Now what a lot of people do is start to look like this. They'll go, So I'm also breathing up in the chest, which stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. Um, the way I was just breathing, I would say, was about 40% effective. So if I keep doing that, I'm going to get it. I'll get there. Okay, 40% is better than 0%. Than but it can take some time to do that. And the more you practice, the better you get at it. Um, and, and it just simply effortless, natural rhythm of your breathing. So it's called natural rhythmic breathing. Any questions about that? stress hormones and some of the research, you know, talks about um, 
in addition to the breathing, you know, like doing whether it's often bilateral movements, you know, walking, running, rowing that are bilateral, almost like echoing EMDR in some way. So do you, all, in addition to the rhythmic breathing, do you generally recommend any sort of physical, um, whether that's mild or moderate exercise no, actually, to yes. go along with it? Or do you, are you more focused no. solely on the No, breathing? that's the second technique. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm, what I'm looking for is, is, is <laughs> What are, what are the underlying principles and the core issues, okay? So I haven't worked with EMDR. I have worked with some people who've been through EMDR and, and had a, a, a follow-up break breakdown with PTSD and they fully recovered uh, after working through the structural emotion. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how that works. I don't know if anyone and, is. And I'm, but, I don't practice EMDR, okay. but from what some of the things I've read is that from the, the principle of it, right. it works on connecting the different hemispheres of the brain, which seems, yeah, seems which is, to be similar to, they say, like, bilateral movement. Right, like which, walking, which cannot be proven in our current yeah. level of standard, yeah. which is nice yeah. speculation. Yeah. Um, but but I, I'm interested in more in what's the underlying principle. In terms of what's happening in the body, uh, my understanding of that is that tension always comes up. Whenever we are tensing, we tense up. It's right in the language. We become uptight. No one ever says, well, I'm down tight today. Okay, <laughs> okay. And so uh, this is the pattern. And what I found is reversing that pattern, okay, is, is what works. And uh, actually the first person I worked with um, when I had my first clinical job was in that residential facility, uh, Francis. And he um, had his eyes shut like this and he would go back like this just screeching when he went back, and they'd pull his rocking chair all the way to the center of the floor, and he'd keep on going back until he could hit his head on the wall, and then they'd pull him just when he got to the wall, pull him out again. And I had to assess him and <laughs> give him a diagnosis. Um, and I went to the meeting. I was just feeling totally, you know, oh, I have no idea what I'm doing here. And his mother and his sister were there, and they visited him every month for years, and he never opened his eyes for them, never acknowledged we're there, just continued to screech and rock back and forth and do this. And, and I learned something about tension when I took a, a movement therapy uh, workshop when I was in graduate school. So I said, you know, I know something about tension. I'll try. He's got a lot of tension. Um, and just gradually worked with him. But ultimately what, it, what I did was taught him to stomp down like that instead of come up like that. I also worked with his shoulders and arms and got him to relax a little bit. Ultimately, was able to work with the breathing a little bit. I used kind of a sandbag and, and just, just do that. Um, and I worked with him every day and because um, I was new and I didn't know what else to do. Um, I mean, I had other work I had to do, but, but it was also the, the director gave us a lot of flexibility. And um, he opened his eyes again and, and was looking around and stopped screeching and stopped rocking back. And when his mother and, and uh, sister came the following month, he actually said, I love you to them. Mm -hmm. Those are the only words he ever said. Um, but he walked around. He was still you know, mentally impaired. He had brain damage. Um, but uh, that reversal of that pattern of tension ultimately was because he was trying to discharge like this. And it just kept on. And I think it gave him a huge headache. And he wanted to hit his head to try to get some relief from the headache. And so getting that down brings it down. So uh, when I had a preschool, um, when I was in graduate school, uh, I would have the kids uh, become gorillas when they started getting too up, you know, and they started to get a little wild. Okay, let's go in the center of the floor and be gorillas. <laughs> and it would settle them down, literally. Okay, I mean, you can't really do that if you're, you know, in class, <laughs> you're getting stressed out. And maybe with preschoolers you can, <laughs> okay. But what you can do is this, okay. And basically, the knees will always lock when tension is building. When I come out of balance, your knees, anyone out of balance will have their knees locked. And you're simply bending the knees does an awful lot, okay? And, and the grounding, which is also, there's a video on it that, that goes into more detail on that on my website. But basically, what you're doing is you're lining up your body so that your skeleton is your primary support, okay? My muscles have to work minimally to hold me in this position. 
and if I start to raise up my shoulders, I feel it and I drop them. Okay? Um, so practicing that position and what I do with when I, when I teach um, in person and what I do with patients, I have them stand and once they get the position, I just have them bounce down, which is the opposite of tensing up. So you're activating the opposite muscles. You cannot tense up when you're bouncing down and the muscles are going back into balance with each other. So every, every, every muscle has an opposing muscle. So if I straighten out my arm, these muscles have got to let go. These are doing the work. I bend my arm. These are doing the work. These have got to let go. When I'm bouncing, the muscles that tense up in reaction to, to tension in reaction to crisis mode have to let go. Okay? And that settles me down. And that has a very significant psychological effect. Um, it, you, can, you can learn to see when someone is not grounded and it's, it's kind of like, I don't want to do it for very long because of the, yeah, yeah, and, and also my head and everything starts becoming conceptual, okay, and I lose touch with what's, what's happening in, in the moment. But to the extent that I'm grounded, I'm much more aware of what's happening in the moment. It's very important in athletics and, and performance and dance and theater and things like that. Um, when people are more grounded, they'll give it a more effective performance. And actually, I used to work as a, as a professional clown in the late 70s and early 80s, and I made a list of, of uh, just the best performances, the ones that just somehow were better than all the others. And it's like, okay, what's, what did I do different there? What's common? And it was interesting, they all started late. Okay, It's like, well, what's that about? Well, I had done my warm-up, and I was ready to go, all set, and I had nothing else to do, so I just did more grounding. Okay? Now, here's another exercise that I do from grounding that, that I teach my students also on my website. Um, and basically, in the position I'll show you, I cannot tense up without falling on my head. So my body won't let me tense up in this position, plus it helps gravity to let go of it. So I'm working with the natural rhythmic breathing at the same time. Okay, let me turn sideways. It's probably easier for you to see. I'll do it out here. Okay. So I'm breathing down here. Let my head drop. So now I'm actually pushing my breath. You can see my breath in my lower back here. I'm pushing it to the bottom of my lungs so that I'm getting movement down there. And that helps those muscles to let go and to stretch. Now, if I can see my feet at this point, I'm tensing my neck. Watch what can happen if I can see my feet. See how I'm tensing my neck? I need to let that go. Okay, so I go down as far as I'm comfortable. Stay there as long as I'm comfortable and then come up the opposite. Come up as I inhale. Relax as I exhale. And my head is the last thing to come up. Okay, so that just basically slows everything down, stops the buildup of tension, and puts you into the moment.